All right, let's go and open in a word of prayer. God, we thank you so much for this morning, and we do just ask that you would now just be with us as we're continuing down the path of church history, or more specifically today is anti-church history. Um, but God, we, we just ask that you would guide us, have your word, Lord, um, to be the preeminent factor in, uh, in all things, Lord, that we would measure folks by, not by our, our uh, personal bent, not by um, anything other than that, Lord, and, uh, your word. So God, we, we would just ask that, uh, bless the time now. Thank you for bringing everyone. All this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Yay. Today's message, actually not message, but little study we're doing is about cross-dressing in the holy toilet seat. Sounds like a punk band name or something. <laughs> um, there is a chair in St. Peter's Basilica that is in the shape of a toilet. And this chair um, has been, well, for hundreds of years, uh, was used as part of every papal ceremony um, coronation when a new pope would come in they would use this toilet seat uh, for every papal ceremony for hundreds of years a toilet seat? <laughs> yes a toilet seat um, others have called it a birthing seat <laughs> a male pope on a birthing seat and uh, yeah, it's an Egyptian purple marble birthing chair or toilet. Okay, so you're telling me this birthing chair for a father dressed like a mother for someone to reach underneath and make sure it's a boy? What do they claim? Testiculos habit. <laughs> I'm not going to uh, translate. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, what would a toilet seat have to do with a papal ceremony? And uh, why would there be any type of ceremony that a newly appointed papa given a physical to make sure he's not a mama? Why would that be? Um, so we're going to investigate today why uh, there's a holy toilet seat in St. Peter's Basilica. So in the, I'll open up your Bible to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And uh, we're falling now with this topic in the 800s, which brings us into the Thyatiran period. So we're in Revelation 2, 18. And interestingly enough, we're going to get some more light from the Bible. Um, it seems like it's... Always shedding more light for us. Thank you, Lord. Here it is, Revelation 2.18, And under the, under the church, under the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Verse 23, And I will kill her children with death. We'll just park it right there. Um, so interestingly enough, we seem to get prophetic utterance from the King James Bible, the trusty old 1611. Um, and we almost get a biography of our subject today. It, and uh, as we're kind of getting into this, I, I, I think you'll see what I'm saying. So uh, first thing I want to look at, uh, the individual we're looking at, number one, has many names. Many names. Um, 
So uh, around 850 AD, uh, Rome receives a new pope who reigned for two and a half years. So this pope has a few names and some aliases, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, the first name this individual goes by is John the Eighth. John the Eighth, um, and sometimes Pope Zacharias. Let's see if I could spell that. Zacharias, um, and also sometimes this um, individual will go by John Anglicus. John Anglicus. And other times, go by a name like this. Huh? Johanna. Okay, or... Pope Joan. Pope Joan? What? Pope Joan. Uh, look back at Revelation 2.20. It says, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, or I put in exclamation tears, or Joan, that calls herself a pope. Pope Joan. A woman pope? Look at uh, Proverbs 25.14. Proverbs 25.14 says, Whoso boasteth himself of a false gift is like clouds uh, and wind without rain. What do you mean false gift? Well, the false gift that the Vatican boasts is this unbroken, untouched by human hands, perfect holy chain of male vicars ever, uh, of vicars of Christ ever since... Peter, the Jewish married, once called Satan by Jesus, first pope, who had never been to Rome, by the way. Um, so to give a kind of time frame of the era, uh, some years before Joni showed up for the uh, Hollywood fish hat performance, uh, let, let's look at a couple things that were going on, just, just to kind of give us a realization of the time frame they were sitting in. And I think I think it'll <laughs> we'll get a kick out of it if nothing. Um, in Constantinople um, in 787 AD another woman named Empress Irene called the Seventh Council now, in 787, in Constantinople, at this council, this is called the Seventh Council, there were two abominations passed into Holy Writ. Number one, image worship. And number two, saint worship, which they still do today, both. And don't believe them when they say, no, we don't. Well, get that thing off your dashboard. Take that thing off your rearview mirror then. Uh, get that thing out of your, uh, uh, off your lawn then. Or, or out of your uh, front door or entryway. Um, so this is allowing us um, the thermometer of the time frame where Pope Joni shows up. And um, so w what are we seeing? Uh, they are not getting closer to the Bible at this point, okay? <laughs> and um, now another thing, about 16 years after Joni, Joni, um, in uh, 869 A.D., uh, the church, so-called, Roman and Greek, had a split. Uh, I'll just put Catholic split. And 
So Roman and Greek had a split, making for a moment a two-headed monster. And then after Pontius the Greek and Nicholas the First excommunicated each other, they actually had a headless monster. And the monster still lives. <laughs> so, as you may notice, uh, this is yet another dark stain on the black robes of the Roman whore uh, that she would need to sweep under the rug as soon as possible. That there was actually a woman that pulled the wool over on the men of the cloth. Cross-dressing in the holy toilet seat. All right, so let's get into our story. So that was a little background. Many names. And now let's look at the main story. How did it go down? All right, so according to these accounts, uh, she was the daughter of an English missionary born at Mayence or Ingelheim and was a woman of very loose morals. Okay, uh, She's said to have removed to Fulda and having there established an improper intimacy with a monk of the convent. What's that mean? Fornication. That's what that... Isn't that weird how they try to paint it a little? Oh, it's improper intimate... N- fornicating, you mean? Okay, fornicating. Uh, it was in this relationship that she assumed some male attire and entered the convent, and afterwards ran away with the monk. So, now the monk supposedly was a very learned man. Where did they leave to? They left to Athens together. Uh, Just the boys, you know? (laughs) She's cross-dressing, and they're traveling around, and he's like, hey, bro, hitting him on the shoulder, and it's it's Joni. She's like, ow! (laughs) And uh, I don't know if they're playing some b-ball or or whatever they're doing, but... uh, Now, it's in Athens she applied herself to the study of Greek and the sciences under her lover's able direction. So he's helping her learn. Now, I guess we could press pause there and say, around this time, uh, it was very unusual that a woman, uh, or maybe even illegal, that a woman would be able to read and learn and teach, etc., Um, So maybe that was a little bit of what was going on with her uh, in in, uh, addition to a number of other uh, devilish things. But after the death of her companion, uh, she went to Rome where she became equally proficient in sacred learning. So she had a good teacher and guess what? She knows just about as much as anybody over there in Rome, which makes you wonder how hard that would really have been. Um, now, <clears throat> for which her reputation became so great under the assumed name Johannes Anglicanus. So she easily obtained holy orders and with such ability and uh, something, uh, the deception that the death of Leo, she was unanimously elected as the successor under the general belief of her male sex. So, uh, Pope Joan is the supposed fictitious female. Why would they have us to think this is fictitious, do you think? Okay, well, because it kind of breaks their whole idea, destroys their whole church. Uh, She was uh, supposed to have occupied the chair of St. Peter as John VIII. We talked about that. But where was between Pope Leo IV and Benedict III? Benedict the Third came in about 853 to 855. So, um, so Joan, a woman whose pontificate lasted two years, five months, four days, after which Benedict the Third was made pope. Um, go ahead to uh, Hebrews 13:4. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hebrews 13.4 Which is a problem that this whole wicked 
church has uh, with. Marriage is honorable in all, even in priests, amen, even in popes. Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled. But what do we find out, and what are we going to find out with Pope Joan's story? But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Look at 1 Corinthians 6.18. 1 Corinthians 6.18 And in 1 Corinthians 6.18 it says, Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Alright, so that's the main story. Now, let's go ahead and move on to the main problem. The main problem. So after the death of her fornicating monk lover, she continued to fornicate. Just like Jezebel. That we, isn't that interesting? The fraud was finally discovered to the infinite mortification of the Roman church. Joni's delivery. All right. So, uh, by her sudden delivery of an infant in the public streets near the Colosseum while heading a religious procession to the Lateran Basilica from the Vatican, she gives birth to a child right there in the streets in front of God and the whole world. And um, so this is evidence today, um, and I'm not gonna, I'm not way beautiful with map drawing or whatever. But um, for instance, if you had uh, the Vatican here and uh, the Lateran Basilica here, the shortest point would be a straight line, right? Now, what, what that straight line would kind of look like would be something like this. Now, uh, this street here is actually called um, the uh, Vicus Papisa. Uh, which means the street of the female Pope. Um, so this for that period of time was the route that they would take in the procession. Now, uh, they take another one that goes kind of like further out. So, like this. So this is the evidence as, as well that why would they avoid that street? Well, because after this issue happened... Um, a birth of a, of a female pope uh, tended to be a little bit inconvenient. And uh, it was kind of just a bad memory every time they would take the straighter route. So they, even to this day, take this indirect route. Um, to avoid the shame on the pontifical sham. So that's uh, Joni's delivery. And then what do we find next is Joni's disannulling. Is it two L's? Disannulling? Mary Chris? Disannulling? I'll just do it too. She's my English teacher. All right. Um, so the mother and child died. Couple stories on this, either by stoning, or um, she being dragged through the streets by a horse, or she was sent to a convent, and the son later became bishop of Austria. Those are the three options. 
Um, but soon after, they're saying she was buried after this. So um, this event <coughs> said to have caused the adoption of the Sela Stercor... <laughs> Let me just write it out. <laughs> Let me just write it out here. So, yeah, the holy toilet seat. Sela Stercor... That's an L. Carreria. Um, and I guess this is because it has to do with the coronation. When the Pope comes in, they need to be coronated, and that's uh, they're going to sit on the cella while they're being coronated and um, given a physical. They're actually given a physical. Well, I'm being facetious. <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't know if they actually say turn your head and cough, but they definitely could. They're doing everything else. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, uh, uh. so um, yeah, so the big purple toilet, um, which was in use from the middle of the 11th century to the time of Leo X, for the purpose of proving the sex of the Pope's elect. Now, what about this purple toilet seat cover-up? <laughs> you know, you got you gotta you gotta have fun while you're learning uh, church history, or which we're specifically <laughs> referring to as anti-church history. Uh, the purple toilet seat cover-up. Um, so this is what they want to say, that the Catholic uh, canons that they have enacted as what they're supposed to do excluded eunuchs from the papal throne. Okay? Um, all right. And uh, so that was contrived to prove that a person elected fulfilled the requirements of the canon. Um, but wh what are really the, the main proofs of this uh, purple toilet seat being in evidence that Pope Joan showed up on the, on the scene? Let's uh, look at that. The main problem, the main story, now the main proofs. The main proofs. This is about 500 separate accounts. Uh, separate accounts of Pope Joan, and most are actually Catholic. Okay, so uh, you can't write off all of them because majority of these are Catholic folks. Um, and at, we watched a little uh, documentary, ladies walking around the streets of the Vatican, just asking random folks, you ever heard of Pope Joan? A guy laughs at her, yeah. He said, that's some interesting history, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, so I guess around St. Peter's seems to be pretty well known, even today, Pope Joan. And um, so... This is all the while, while today they deny everything with Pope Joan, just like they're doing with thousands of molestations. Denying everything, right? Um, now, uh, we'll list out a few of these, and I might spell these wrong because I'm not Italian. <laughs> but, uh, so, uh, witnesses in Siena... There's uh, Dominican and minorities in the area, which I guess is just regular people. Attest to Pope Joan. Uh, next, uh, Boccaccio di Cameron. That's a B.
he wrote a book called Certain Famous Women. Uh, where Pope John shows up as number 51. Uh, next, uh, Cardinal Baroni, a 17th century Catholic historian. Cardinal. Cardinal Baroni, 17th century Catholic historian, documents that a bust was made of her face, which is a uh, statue, statue of her face, which is actually in St. Peter's, that bore her name, was actually uh, later on covered up with the new name, Zacharias. Pope Zacharias, which is actually Pope Joan. And um, now, let's start up here, because I ran out of room. Then, uh, Martin Polonies. Uh, who's a, also a uh, historian. Uh, he was actually an advisor to, to the Pope of his time. Um, he gave credence to the evidence of Pope Joan. Um, also, and this is kind of getting more funny, the whole thing is just ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> That's why we're having fun looking at it because it's, you know, uh, they play dress up and, you know, is, they'll lie to you and you lie to them. And as long as you don't point out that they're lying to you, they won't point out that you're lying to them. And, and it's all just a big game, like a big dress up party. Um, now, uh, Humphrey Shuttleworth. Sorry, right? So ugly. Humphrey Shuttleworth in 1785. And remember, these are just a handful of 500 uh, points, okay? Uh, he wrote a book called, this is good, A Present for a Papist. Merry Christmas, right? A present for a papist or the history of the life of Pope Joan proving that a woman called Joan really was a pope. And uh, about this, uh, in, in the material I found about this, uh, they said, it, is all, uh, it has been all but universally discarded. And uh, what would we say? Uh, what does the word Catholic mean? <laughs> Universal. It has all been but universally discarded. Yeah, I, I wonder why. I wonder why you've discarded Pope Joan. Um, and we're going to end with this, is I wanted to give you the moral character of popes through the ages. And just to... Because I'm... <gasps> A woman pope? Oh, giving birth right in the street? So, oh, I mean, that's supposed to be such a holy, uh, sanctified office. They are the vicar of Christ. Uh, let me list you off another uh, vicious vicars. Uh, pope Marcy uh, Marcellinus. He sacrificed to idols, which, I mean, the pope today does that. I mean, what's so shocking about that? Um, number two, uh, Pope Honorius uh, at the Council of Constantinople decreed, uh, we have caused Honorius, the late pope of old Rome, to be accursed, for in that he followed the mind of Sergius the heretic and confirmed his wicked doctrines. Uh, which pope hasn't had wicked doctrines? Uh, 
Number three, the Council of Basel thus condemned Pope Eugenius. We condemn and dispose Pope Eugenius, a despiser of the Holy Canons. The Holy Canons being this Holy Canon? (laughs) <laughs> if that was the case, a lot of uh, quote-unquote Christian pastors should be condemned. Uh, but, despiser of holy canons, a disturber of the peace and unity of the Church of God, a notorious offender of the whole universal church, a simonist, a perjurer, a man incorrigible, a schismatic, a man fallen from the faith, and a willful heretic. You know, Randy, these aren't very bad. Well, I mean, really, I, as where we're sitting, we're like, every pope is guilty of these. Okay? Now, uh, we move on to more uh, interesting uh, things. Pope John II was publicly charged at Rome with incest. Okay? Uh, pope John uh, the Thirteenth usurped the pontificate, spent his time in hunting, in lasciviousness, and monstrous forms of vice, he fled from the trial to which he was summoned, and stabbed, being taken in the act of adultery. Say that? Pope uh, John the Thirteenth, Number 13. Good number for a pope. Uh, and then number six, Pope Sixtus uh, IV licensed brothels at Rome. Uh, Pope Alexander IV was, as a Roman Catholic historian says, one of the greatest and horrible monsters in nature that could scandalize the Holy Chair. His beastly morals and immense ambition, his insatiable av- avarice, Probably didn't say that, right? His detestable cruelty, his furious lusts, and monstrous incest with his daughter Lucretia are at large described by uh, uh, Guisardini, Siaconius, and other authentic papal historians, which means what? That's Catholic history. They're telling us about it. We're not... We're not uh, having to turn over every rock to find the... No, we're just going... Uh, even for Pope Joan, we don't even have to really depend on anti-Catholic material at all. It's Catholic material. They're telling us. Um, now, uh, of the popes, a Roman Catholic named Platina says, "...the chair of St. Peter was usurped rather than possessed." By monsters of wickedness, ambition, and bribery, they left no wickedness unpracticed. And what we covered, we covered uh, incest uh, and adultery as being the worst. But nowhere, you know, this has been added now uh, with molestations. Which, are, are we too stupid to assume they've been happening ever since that? Oh, no, it's just been in the past 10, 20 years. No, I'm sorry. And uh, this is one of their benchmarkers. Uh, This is how they do things. And uh, Pope Joan serves as a reminder that the Roman Catholic Church should really take to heart and anyone else uh, living a life of sin under the guise of righteousness with God. Pope Joan is a reminder. Let's look at Numbers 32, and we'll close with this verse. Numbers chapter 32, and verse 23. And it says in Numbers 32, verse 23, But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord, and behold, your sin will find you out. Behold, I read it wrong. Behold, be sure your sin will find you out. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much, God, for your word. We thank you, God, that you have given us light, that we can measure anybody, uh, whether 
uh, in a fish hat or not, whether behind a pulpit or not, whether carrying a King James Bible or not. We can measure anybody by that book, Lord, and you are going to give us light on where they sit and uh, whose side they're on. And God, we, we just ask, Lord, that you would help us to learn uh, from the errors of these folks in the past, God, that we don't have to be deceived thinking that this Roman church was ever anything other than just a group of tares, Lord. And, uh, you know, as we're sitting here, we have Catholic family, Lord, that is unsaved. And God, we pray that you would use us, God, as tools in your hand to lead them out, Lord, and surround them with real Christians, Lord, that would just make them to long for sweet peace and for faith to increase, Lord. And uh, just ask now that you'd bless your word. In the name of Jesus, amen.